Welcome back to another Mac Deck Tech. Today we're going over Grand Larceny, helmed by Goaty Canny Acquisitor. Uh, so this deck's really all about stealing your opponent's cards and playing them. Uh, so whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, we're going to look at the top card of that player's library, exile it face down. Uh, so for as long as it's exiled face down, we get to cast it and spend mana of any color to do so. So a lot of the supports that we're going to be adding in are, you know, more unblockable creatures, creatures that get rewarded for already getting in for that kind of damage and whatnot. Uh, but let's get started. As always, we're taking out 10 cards and putting in 10 new ones without touching the lands. So first up on the chopping block is Chaos Wand. Yes, it technically lets us cast a spell that an opponent controls, uh, but kind of a few issues, right? Um, one, we don't know what we're casting, so we're spending a minimum of seven mana for the first spell, right? Three to get out the Chaos Wand, four to tap it and do the ability. The spell itself is free, you know, in the sense that we're not paying extra for it. We're only paying the four to tap the Chaos Wand. Uh, we're limited to instant or sorcery cards, which is fine. They tend to be pretty powerful, could be pretty impactful. Um, but we don't know what we're hitting, right? So seven mana to not know what you're going to hit isn't great. This works really well in exile, specifically exile-themed decks that care about casting from exile. Or even more of a spell slinging deck that cares about you casting instant sorceries. But this deck ain't it. Cunning Rhetoric. So whenever an opponent attacks you, or you know, one of your planeswalkers, you get to exile the top card of their library. You can play it for as long as it remains exiled, and you can spend mana of any color to cast it. So Cunning Rhetoric actually fits the deck pretty well, but it's not going to give us any payoff unless we're being attacked. So in that sense, it's like, all right, I'm going to spend three mana now. It's not going to have any impact. And then on a future turn, after I've already been attacked, maybe I bother to spend mana casting this, right? It's it's more reactive, and I, be, I prefer to be proactive in my plays, personally. Not a bad card, though, so I can totally see people deciding to keep it. Dark Steel Ingot. Uh... Feels weird in this deck. It is a three-color deck, so I get that, like, you kind of want to have some mana rocks to do some mana fixing. I would honestly almost rather just have a Commander's Sphere over this, though. Uh, it does the same thing in terms of tapping for extra mana, but in lieu of indestructibility, I could always sack it off for card draw if I need to dig to find an answer. But generally speaking, we're not here for three mana artifacts to tap for a single bit of mana. Edric, Spymaster of Trust. So whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents, doesn't have to be our creatures, could be any of them. Uh, the controller of those creatures get to draw a card. Um, so it's a little group hug. Obviously, it also applies to us. It kind of encourages our opponents to attack each other and not attack us. So it's another card that I could see myself... You know, maybe keeping after some playtesting with it, seeing how the pod reacts. But card draw is really powerful, and I try to avoid letting my opponents have it. Up next is an older Goaty, specifically the Lord of Luxury. He is a 4 cost 2 3 with Death Touch. When the ETB you look at the top 4 cards of a single opponent's library, exile one of them face down, you get to cast it kind of what we're already doing, but it's a one-off. And, a, you know, 2-3 Death Toucher for th 4 mana. Not bad, but not great. I'm looking for more repeatability, though. Nashi, Moon, Sages, Scion. Scion. There we go. Words. I can talk. Um, so it's got a little bit of ninjutsu. I think ninjutsu is an effect that would be cool in this deck if we had more ways of kind of bouncing creatures back to hand to, like, re-ninjutsu later and whatnot. Uh, but either way, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we're going to exile the top card of their library. Until end of turn, we get to play those spells, and we're spending life instead of mana. 
There might be like a little bit of life gain in this deck, but it's definitely not prevalent. Uh, that being said, life is always still a resource, so we're kind of happy to spend it. Uh, we could get in with an unblockable and pay extra to make sure this gets in, potentially letting us cast a spell. Um, but again, it feels very one-off. I'm looking for things that are going to be more repeated. Oblivion Sower. Uh, so this 6 cost, 5, 8, not bad stats. When you cast this spell, target opponent is going to exile the top 4. Uh, you get to steal any lands exiled that way. Uh, which could be cool, but by the time you have 6 mana to cast this, don't get me wrong, more mana is always nice. But, again, it's a one-off effect. If we were doing some, like, blinking shenanigans, I think Oblivion Sower could be cool. Uh, if we were in more of a land matters kind of deck, I think Oblivion Sower could be cool. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe I, I'll suggest it for the, uh, the desert deck, which cares much more about these lands. But for now, Oblivion Sower's out of here. Sage of the Beyond. So, seven mana for a 5-5 flyer. Spells that we cast from anywhere other than our hand cost two less. Uh, so this is actually pretty good for this deck, right? Uh, the spells that we're casting that happen to belong to our opponents are being cast from exile, so not our hand, so they do have a two mana reduction there. Seven mana to get that is a little expensive in my mind. Uh, we could foretell it, uh, ultimately paying the seven mana but split between two turns, so it feels a little better, but still not great. Uh, this is repeatable, you know, is it is it being cut when it shouldn't be? Maybe. Uh, a little hard to say. Uh, if Wizards wants to sponsor me and send me these decks early so I can play test them and make better deck techs, that'd be cool. <laughs> uh, but until that dream happens, I'm gonna have to go with my gut on this. Silent Blade Oni. Uh, so this is another 7 cost, it's a 6-5. You could ninjutsu it out for a mere 6. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you're going to look at their hand. You're going to cast one of their cards for free. Um, so this has cost issues. Obviously, the cost is prohibitive because, like, you're getting a free spell when they hit. Uh, we did add a couple things that are going to make creatures unblockable. So, like, it would make this effect a little stronger for us. Um... I don't know. I feel like there are just better cards out there, things that are going to synergize a little more, and not be dependent on other cards to be more repeatable. Uh, so Silent Blade Oni, I took you out. Last up for our cuts is Void Attendant. Uh, so they have to Void. Doesn't really make a difference here, um, but they don't technically have a color despite using green mana. We could pay one to green to put a card an opponent owns from Exile into their graveyard. In doing so, we create a 1-1 colorless Eldrazi Scion, which we could sack for colorless mana. I mean, like, it gives us something to do with the spells that we don't want to cast. It kind of lets us store up mana in these little, little dorks that we're sacrificing. Eh. It's not bad. It is repeatable. But I, th I think we could do better than... Oh, here, you could have this back in your grave so that I could create a little dork. But those are the cuts. That being said, let's move on to what we're adding in. Starting off that list, we have Rogue Class. So, for a blue and a black, we get to immediately have it so whenever our creatures deal combat damage to a player, we get to exile the top card of their library. We get to look at it for as long as it remains exiled. Um, at level 2, we give our creatures menace, making them a little harder to block, which makes, you know, rogue class as well as our commander go off a little more consistently. And once we tip it up to the third level, we now get to cast those spells that we've exiled with rogue class. Uh, it is a little bit of a management issue, right? We're going to have to tuck cards specifically under rogue class to be like, hey, this was exiled by rogue class and not by Gaunty. Um, but I think the extra payoff is worth it. Court of Lockthwain. 
So a four mana enchantment, when it ETBs we become the monarchs, we're immediately gonna get at least like a little bit of card draw off of it. And at each of our upkeeps, we're gonna exile the top card of a single opponent's deck to play it as long as it remains exiled. We get to spend mana as though we're any color. And if we are the monarch, uh, the first one we cast for the turn is free. So, it does kind of put a little target on our back. Uh, that being said, you know, I think we have enough creatures and some, like, decent removal to kind of keep ourselves safe. Moving up into our artifacts, we have the Whisper Silk Cloak. So they can't be blocked, they have Shroud. You know, just a good way to make sure that our creatures are getting in for that damage. You know, we're going to take back the Monarch. In a similar vein, we have the Silver Shroud costume from the Fallout Commander sets. Uh, so, it's a flashable, two-cost equipment. It's going to give the creature Shroud for only the turn that it comes in, and then the equipped creature can't be blocked. So again, we're making it so our creatures can kind of get in, hit them for damage, trigger all of our effects, have a good time. Moving up into some instants, we have Outrageous Robbery. So this is a two black X spell. So target opponent is gonna exile the top X cards of their library face down. We get to look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If we cast a spell this way, we could spend mana of any color to cast it. So really just a nice way for us to at instant speed, especially if someone has tutored to the top of their library steal whatever, you know, important cards they're looking for. Super budget. It's less than a buck to pick this up. Uh, but it also just furthers the whole, like, hey, I'm playing all of your cards strategy that Gonti is going for. Moving right along up into our creatures, we have Tiny Bones the Pickpocket. Uh, so it looks like he's sitting around, like, the $18 to $20 range right now. He's a 1-1 Death Toucher for a single black pip. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we get to cast a non-land permanent card from their grave, and we could use mana of any type to cast it. So instead of ripping off of the top of their deck, we're going to have more options to see. It's not at random, right? We get to be like, oh, I like that spell. Don't mind if I do. Continuing along our creature trend, we have Grim Hireling. So a 3-2 for 4, stats aren't great, but that's okay. Whenever one or more of our creatures deal combat damage to a player, we're going to create two treasure tokens. We could also pay black and sacrifice treasures to give a creature minus X minus X at sorcery speed. We also have Crashing Drawbridge, a 0-4 defender to give our creatures haste. The Cephalid Face Taker, a 1-4 for 3 that can't be blocked. Beginning of combat on our turn, we could have it become a copy of another creature, except that it's still a 1-4 and still can't be blocked. Uh, so this actually works really well with any of our other creatures that care about themselves dealing damage. Last up for our additions, we have Tasha, the Witch Queen. Uh, so whenever we cast a spell that we don't own, which we're planning on doing quite a bit, we're going to create a 3-3 demon creature token. Her plus one allows us to draw a card. For each opponent, we're going to exile a target instant or sorcery from their grave and put a page counter on it. And for minus three, we get to cast a spell with a page counter on it for free. All right, guys, those are the upgrades that I'm suggesting. I tried to keep them fairly budget. I know that Tiny Bones was a little expensive, but I think he was basically the only kind of like little pricey card. As always, of course, we do have some honorable mentions that didn't make the cut either for just not being top 10 or just being a little expensive. Let's take a look at them. Stuttering off our honorable mentions is Agent of Treachery, a 2 3 4 7. Uh, but whenever he ETBs, we do get to steal a permanent, so that's nice. And at the beginning of our end step, if we control at least three permanents that we don't own, we get to draw three cards. So this will actually keep our hand nice and juicy. Stats aren't great for 7 mana, but the card draw really makes up for it. They do sit around, you know, the 6 to $8 range. So 
Not terribly expensive, but definitely not super cheap either. Changeling Outcast, on the other hand, is very budget. They are a changeling that can't block or be blocked. Um, so, super cheap. You're going to get them out early if you want to put them in. They just didn't quite make my top ten. But they're, they're very valid. Gix Yogmoth Printer. So, this is sitting around like the $20 to $25 range. One of our creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents. Its controller can pay one life. If they do, they get to draw a card. So it is a little group huggy. It's kind of why I took out the um, the one creature from earlier. Uh, it's great for us, obviously. Like, our creatures are getting through constantly. We're drawing cards. We're keeping our hand full. A little pricey. Feels like you kind of want to build around it more so than have it in the 99, in my opinion. But, uh, definitely strong. Grimma, Saruman's Footman, is a 1-4 for 4 that can't be blocked. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, they're going to exit the top part of their library until they exile it instead of a sorcery. We get to cast it for free, and then they put the exiled cards uh, that weren't cast to the bottom of their deck in a random order. Honestly, pretty good. He's super budget. Um, just didn't quite make my top 10. Again, it's a situation where it's like, you know, if the instant or sorcery is like a board wipe, I think we'd say may cast. Yeah, if we may cast it, we could theoretically leave it in exile, but I'd, I'd prefer to have steal the cards and be able to cast them at my leisure. The discount's nice, though. Invisible Stalker is just another unblockable boy. He's hexproof. He does cost two mana for a 1-1, but we're going to get the value off of him. Mercurial Spell Dancer is another unblockable creature. It's a 2-1 for 2, so a little better than the Invisible Stalker in that sense. Not hexproof, though. Uh, whenever we cast a non-creature spell, we get to put an oil counter on it, and whenever it deals damage to a player, we can remove two oil counters from it, uh, and we get to copy the next instant or sorcery that we cast. So, definitely feels a little more on the spell slingy side, um, but the unblockability is nice for the deck. Opposition Agent is real nice. Um, we get to flash them in. Our opponents are controlled by us while searching, so whenever an opponent is searching their library, they exile each card that they find, and we get to play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. Uh, this card's expensive. You know, it's... You know, the range is actually kind of big on this. It sits around... Like, the low 20s to mid 30s. Um, I assume it depends on some style points for it. But it's a super strong card, but the, the price is a little prohibitive here. Thada, Adele, Acquisitor. Uh, so we have another Acquisitor here. For 3 mana, we get a 2-2 two -two with Island Walk. The Island Walk may or may not be relevant, uh, but whenever it deals combat damage to a player... We can search that player's library for an artifact, exile it, uh, and then until end of turn, we can play that card. So they sit around like the $14 mark. We definitely do really well in an artifact-centric deck. Um, but, you know, we know our opponents are going to have soul rings, they're going to have other mana rocks. Um, so it could be good. Uh, the price is kind of why I cut it. But I think the, the effect is strong, and especially if you have other people with the pod playing blue. You know, the island walk is basically cool. I'ma hit you, and I'ma I'm a steal your shit. Xanathar Guild Kingpin. Uh, is actually pretty close to budget. Uh, it looks like on the lower end, he's around 2 bucks. At the higher end, he's around 9 bucks. But at the beginning of our upkeep, we get to choose an opponent until end of turn. They don't get to cast any spells, and we get to look at the top card of their library at any time. We can cast spells off the top of their library and use mana of Zelda or any color. So we don't even have to hit for this, right? We're just like, yep. I'ma I'm just take cards off the top of your deck. Don't mind me. Uh, so the six mana cost is a little high. I kind of went for a I'ma chip at you with creatures to get my card theft on. But I think he's a solid add. Praetor's Grasp is up next, a sorcery for three. We get to look through an opponent's library, exile a card face down. They shuffle. 
We get to cast it for as long as it remains exiled. We don't get to cheat the mana, though. Uh, so the inability to cheat the mana and the fact that it sits around 16 to, like, you know, 30 bucks is also a little prohibitive. Uh, but if it it's the strategy of playing our opponent's cards. Deadly Rollick and Fierce Guardianship are just free spells. We're in the colors. We may as well play them. Last up for the Honorable Mentions is also a budget card. Uh, it's Reconnaissance Mission. So for four mana, whenever a creature that we control deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. Uh, I think we have a fair bit of card draw already in the deck. We also have all the cards that we're stealing from our opponents that so are not in hand. We do have access to them. Uh, if you feel like you're missing some card draw, I think Reconnaissance Mission is an excellent add. Sits so around a dollar, maybe a little less. But, guys, those are the honorable mentions. Uh, obviously, you can go for some some other blue, black, and green powerhouses. But, you know, I think that we, we covered the ones that more closely follow what this deck's doing. But I'll obviously pick up Cyclonic Rift. It's super good, but a little expensive. <laughs> but, guys, uh, we'll do another Thunder Junction deck tech next week. Until next time, you know, have a good one. If you enjoyed the video, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. And we will catch you next week, uh, which will be after I've gone to the Thunder Junction pre-release, which I'm going to tomorrow. Uh, well, I guess it's today when the video goes up. It's Thursday when recording. Uh, but either way, I'm rambling. I'm Mechanized Minion. Peace out.